Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. If you want to turn to Genesis chapter 16 verse 11 in your King James Bibles, that's where we're going to start. Um, if you see me, I'm wearing my sweater and my knitted cap. Um, I had all the windows open last night and lately the weather's just been different this year. Um, we had a lot of we had a lot of fog yesterday morning and then the sun came out. It was very warm. I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, sitting out on the deck, doing some work in the yard. Um, and then the evening was beautiful. I had the gold. I always tell people the Lord blesses me with gold when the sun's going down. It's right on the horizon. It shines a dark orange on all the trees and everything. It's like, that's the gold. God gives me the gold in the mornings. And then on the ocean, the little view I have of the ocean during the right time of the year, when the sun's coming over that, it'll sparkle off the ocean and it looks like silver. So God blesses me with gold and silver. And we just read that passage where the house of God is made up of gold and silver, or you can be wood and earth. You can be to honor, or you can be to dishonor. And you don't want to be to dishonor, and you don't want to be the wood and the earth. Brothers and we just strive for that gold and that silver. But I opened up all the windows and woke up this morning that we had fog hardcore. And the house was cold. <laughs> it was very cold. So, buttoned up the windows like I do with this. That's, how, that's my AC for the, for the summer. I open the windows at night. I run a few fans. It uh, cools down the house so that during the day it can stay pretty cool in here. And at the heat of the day when it's so hot outside, I can come in and sit down. Praise the Lord. Um, trying to work my way around where I'm not using AC a lot or... The electric heater, that's why one of the prayer requests I had, Brothers of Christ, was for a wood stove. Um, but just so you know, I'm wearing this because it is cold this morning because I left everything open, closed everything up, and that's why I'm wearing this. You're like, it's summertime, how could you wear that? Well, um, because it is kind of cold in here. But someone, a brother in Christ, made a prayer request that I do a study on abortion. Because you had the Roe versus Wade got overturned, and therefore the decision whether abortion is legal or illegal goes back to the states. Don't listen to a lot of the propaganda junk out there. They're like, they outlawed abortion. No, they didn't outlaw abortion. Abortion just went back to the states to decide what to do with it. Okay, that's all. The federal, it just, the uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned saying that the federal government has no authority in this matter. It's being sent to the states. So the states get to decide um, if abortion's okay or not. And right now, the two big states that are still for abortion, which is California and New York, and I can't remember which one, but one of them has this instituted a law that even like 20 days after birth, you can still elect to have an abortion. Uh, no, that's murder, but they claim it's a abortion. That's how bad it's gotten. But they asked me to do a study on what does God think about abortion. So let's get into this and see what God thinks about abortion. You, you, you've probably watched a lot of news. You've probably watched a lot of videos. And you get to see the world's way. Let me look something up real quick. The world's way of what they believe uh, 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 I did it wrong. Okay, 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world? See, you go get online and you, you start listening to people and people have feelings, they have opinions, you have the lost world trying to justify sin for a season, and you got all this stuff that you're hidden from there, and a brother in Christ is like, what does the Bible say about it? What is, how does God feel and what does God think about abortion? And that's what we're going to get into today. So we're going to start with Genesis 16. Now, the lost world, brothers of Christ, likes to use the word um, pregnant. Okay, I don't use the word pregnant. I used to, and sometimes I might slip up, brothers and sisters, because all of us can be a hypocrite sometimes by accidentally slipping up and falling back into old habits when we kicked them and said it's wrong, we're not going to do it anymore, and sometimes we fail sometimes. I predominantly tried, God help get me get pregnant out of my vocabulary. The reason the lost world went to pregnant is because they don't like the Bible term with 
child. All that thing that's in you, it's, a, it's not a person. It's, it's, it's like, you know, if you were to pull a weed. When we have an abortion, it's like pulling a weed. You know, it's, it's just nothing. It's just nothing. But is that what the Bible says? Now, you won't find the word pregnant in the Bible. What you will find is, is we're going to start in Genesis 6, 11. We're going to look at the word with child. We're going to look at the word child. And then we're going to look at the word children. And then we're going to compare it to the scriptures and say, is that just a thing, a nothing? Or is that a person? Okay. Genesis 16, 11. And this is for Bible-believing, God-fearing, Christian, uh, born again, bought with the blood, Church of God, Church of the Living God. That's what the house of God is, the Church of the Living God. We just talked about the house of God is made up of gold and silver and wood and earth. And what is that? Well, what's the house of God? The house of God today is made up of the Church of the Living God. Okay. This is for you who care about God's Word. The lost world doesn't care about God's Word. We need to preach the Gospel to the lost world. But for my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, Genesis 16:11, we read, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, not pregnant, with child, and shalt bear a son. Even told her it's going to be a son, not a daughter, a son. And shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. So here we see inside the woman, the womb, it's called child. It's a child. Turn to Genesis 17.12. I tried to keep these close together so we didn't have to turn so far. But turn to Genesis 17.12. Oops, went too far. This is my big lettering, my huge giant lettering one. Some chapters take two to three pages. <laughs> um, the Lord bless me with this. Uh, Genesis 17.12 says, And he that is eight days old shall be circum circumcised among you. See, it's important to understand it says eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generation. So eight days, we're not talking about me, a grown man as a man child. It's talking about kids that are eight days old, just eight days out of the womb. Every man, child, in your generation, he that is born in the house or bought with money of a stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house. Hmm. Okay. So we see that child is used in the womb, it's a child. Outside the womb, it's a child. Hmm. Uh, turn to Genesis 25. You can go all throughout the Bible. There's a lot of situations where a child is referred to inside the womb and outside the womb. We just grabbed one of each uh, for the sake of time. In Genesis 25, 20, you only need one of each to prove that it's referred to in, in the womb as a child and it's referred to outside the womb as a child. Okay. There's no getting around that. What about children? Genesis 25, 20. There. Genesis 25, 20, we read, And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of... I have a hard time pronouncing these. Pa Paden... Er, er, Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Once again, who did Isaac go to for a child? We had another study we talked about where who, who is it that decides that someone has a child? God does. What is abortion about? You playing God and deciding whether you want to have a child. Okay? Remember, God's the one who decides when someone gets um, is with child. Almost said throw away. Is with child. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled with together within her. She had twins. She had twins, triplets, quadruplets, their children in the womb. 
And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manners of people shall be separate from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. So what do we read there? The children struggled together within her. So they're called children. They're called a child in the womb. They're called children in the womb. Okay. The moment they're conceived, they're called children. The moment you con the child is conceived, it's called a child in the womb. Genesis 32, 1. Turn to Genesis 32, 1. So that was inside the womb. Now this word went back away so you can understand what's going on here. And Jacob went on his way, and the angel of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Manam. And Jacob sent messages before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir. Jacob's trying to go back to his home, and he sees Esau coming, and he's fearful. What's Esau's attitude, his brother? What's his attitude going to be? Is he going to kill him? The country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban, and stayed there until now. And I have oxen, and asses, and flocks, and men servants, and women servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he came to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. It's not just Esau coming out, there's 400 men. This could be a band of soldiers. What's Esau's intent? Verse 7, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels, into two bands, and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saith unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, I will deal with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies of all the truth which thou hast showed unto my, thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I have become two bands. Got one over here, one over here. Okay. Verse 11, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. There we see it. I read it so you understand what's going on. Jacob's coming out. He's meeting his brother Esau. He breaks it into two bands, and he's got children in both. So if he goes over here and smites this one, children are going to die. If he goes over and smites this one, and this one gets to escape, Children are going to die, okay, with the children. So we see here that in the womb they're called children, out of the womb they're called children. Multiple, it means more than one. Okay? It's more than one child, that's what children is, it's more than one child. And we see that the word child, while it's in the womb, it's called a child. While it's out of the womb, it's called a child. Now one of the big arguments is, is that when it's in the womb, it's not a person. It's, it's nothing until it actually comes out of the womb. But as I just said, in California, California or New York, one of them passed a law that so many days outside the womb, you can still elect to have a so-called abortion. It's not an abortion, it's murder. When it's, I mean, it's always been our It's outside the womb, it's murder. But the big controversy is what about inside the womb? Well, we just saw that a child, it's called a child when it's inside the womb. And if there's more than one child, if you have twins or something, it can be called children. And outside the room is called a child and it's children. Okay? So the big thing is, is a child, child a person? We're going off the word child. Is it a person? That's what's in you. The moment you conceive, you are with child. Not pregnant. With child. Okay? 
they changed the word so the women, they could keep the women from being uh, convicted so much. If you kept saying you're with child, that's a child that's growing in you, that's a person that's growing in you, do you want to get an abortion and kill that person? See, that really convicts people. But if you take that all away and it's just pregnant, you're just pregnant and it's just a thing, it's nothing. It's nothing. Now understand that in the scriptures it talks about Jesus Christ, that holy thing that's in you, but it's still referred to as a child. We'll get to that. Still referred to, he's still referred to as a child in the womb. Right. But here we're on, is a child a person? Luke 180. Turn to Luke 180. Yes, 80 verses in Luke chapter 1. Which means this is going to be 50 pages. Like I said, for one chapter, just a side note, one chapter is three pages when you get to the huge font books, which helps with my eyes. But this is what I've been doing my highlighting with. <laughs> side note. Um, but Luke chapter 1, verse 80. Luke chapter 1, verse 80. And the child grew. Does a child in the, wo in the womb grow? Absolutely. Does a child outside the womb grow? Yes. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. There's a lowercase s there, spirit. And was in the desert till the days of his showing unto Israel. I'm talking about John the Baptist. So it shows here a child has a spirit. Lowercase s. Luke 2.40. Jump over one chapter to Luke 2.40. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. Filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. But here you see again, a child has a lowercase s spirit. Hmm. Turn to 1 Kings 17. Back to the Old Testament. 1 Kings 17. Kings 17. And he stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Remember the story of Elijah. Okay, where he brought the child to life. He prayed to the Lord, and the Lord brought the child back to life. Okay? But here we say that the soul of the child. Hmm. Oh, oh, this is just, 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 you know, this is just, that doesn't, the people that don't want truth will be like, this is nothing, I, I don't want to hear it, la, 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 la. A child has a, we just read that, has a spirit, it has a soul. And of course, it has a physical form inside the womb, outside the womb. It has a physical body. Even if it starts at molecules, if they try to say just molecules because you just are with child, it just starts. You still have a physical form. A child has a physical form. It has a spirit. It has a soul. Okay. Once again, some people that couldn't understand, that can't stand. Standing for the Godhead over the Trinity, the word person, we keep coming back showing them the Bible definition of the word person is an individual man, woman, or child being consistent of body and soul. We apply the word to living beings only. So you have a body and a soul, and we apply them to living beings only. Spirit. Lowercase that spirit. You have to have a spirit or you're dead. Okay, they yielded up the ghost. Okay, the Old Testament, they yielded up the ghost. They yielded up the ghost. They, they yielded up the spirit. When they die, the spirit leaves. When you're alive, you have the spirit, the lowercase s spirit. You have a spirit. Okay. Possessed of a rational nature, the body when dead is not called a person. It is applied alike to man, woman, or child. Now, I took out the word human because I don't. We're going to do a study on words to no profit. Uh, talk about the word human. Uh, I don't. You like the word human? The word hue versus man. Um, it, it's a it's a word that has to do with men trying to be God. 
Okay, we can have our own wisdom. What did we just read over there? Okay. What did we just read over there? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For, he, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And that's what hue is all about. The word hue. It's about, uh, ye can be as gods knowing good and evil. Being wise, it's like wise man. Homo sapien. And then homo sapien sapien. So we're no longer wise men. We're wise, wise men. Okay? But I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll be doing a study on that separately. But I like using that in the definition. That's why I had said an individual man, woman, or child. When the, the Webster's 18 dic 1820 dictionary used the word human. See, the Webster's 1820 dictionary is okay to use, but it's not our final authority. I'm pointing over there on my shelf. It's not our final authority. Okay? But we see here that a child meets the requirements to be called a person. It has a body. It has a soul. It has a spirit. Whether in the womb or out of the womb, it is a person. Okay? You want more proof that it is a person? Okay. Turn to Luke 139. You say, oh, that's kind of, you know, that's not strong enough for me to believe that it's a person. Well, turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 39. Luke 1. 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judea. Now before this, the angel of the Lord comes to her and tells her that, you know, she's going to, that God's going to use her to give birth to God manifest in the flesh. Right? Jesus Christ. Okay? And tells her these promises. And then what she does is she goes to see um, Elizabeth. Zacharias and Elizabeth are the parents of John the Baptist. So that's where we are. And Mary rose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judea and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, not in me, but in her, the babe that's in the womb, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my capital L Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leapt in my womb for Joy. Remember that, brothers of Christ. Joy. The child, here it says, babe, that's in the womb, could feel joy. It's very important. Verse 35, And blessed is she that believeth, that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, real quick, up here it says, Blessed are... Um, and whence is this to me that the mother, present tense, of my Lord should come? So at this point, I believe Mary was with child, even though it's not super specific, but it says that the mother, present tense, of my Lord should come to me. Okay. Some people say, oh, she wasn't really with child yet, but she could. Either way, the, bio, the child leapt, and it's important, okay, with joy. That's the important part for this study. Uh, Let's look at um, Psalm 63.5. Turn to Psalm 63.5. We're all over the Bible today. Which is good. Psalm 63.5. It says, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Joyful lips. Okay? Because what they'll say is it's just a body. There's no spirit. There's no soul. It's just a body in the womb. It's nothing until it comes out. Okay? But notice here it says, I shall praise thee with, the jo with my jo joyful lips. 
Yeah, lips are physical. It's the body. But what does this Bible say? You don't have to turn. But Matthew 12, 34 says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Luke 6, 45 says, A good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Right. Now, you can do more study on it. Can the body have joy? My studies say that it comes from the heart when you have joy. So, when we get done with the study, we're going to go to two more parts where we're going to see that the soul can have joy and the spirit can have joy. But I didn't see, find anything that says the body has joy. It's just with the lips, joyful lips. In other words, the joy that's in your heart is coming out through your words and your voice, whether you're singing praise, whether you're just so happy that you got to tell someone about something great that happened to you. It's words. Okay. So we see that uh, uh, body, because people say it's just a body. It's just, a, you know, it's just like a weed, you know, when it's inside the womb, it's nothing until it actually comes out. Uh, we already said in the Old Testament, it says with child, in the womb, out of the womb. Okay. Child has a body, has a soul, has a spirit. It's a person. But this is us proving even some more. We hear the word joy. A child in the womb leapt for joy. So turn to Psalms 35 9. Turn back to Psalms 35 9. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in His salvation. Now, as we're going to go through here, you're going to realize we're, we're going to talk, this little side, like uh, we call it a rabbit trail. Where is our joy? What is true joy found in? When we start reading about joy, what is true joy found in? And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. The lost world doesn't know what true joy is. I never knew what true joy was until I truly got saved and born again. Okay? But a soul can be joyful. A, a soul can feel joy. Isaiah 61.10. Turn to Isaiah 61.10. Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. There we see it. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garment of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorned herself with her jewels. My soul shall be joyful. And what's that joy in? In the Lord. John the Baptist in her room leaped for joy in what? In the Lord. Mary, I believe, was with child with the Lord. She's the mother of the, of the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh in the likeness of sinful flesh. So that's a soul. A soul can be joyful. What about a spirit? Isaiah 65, 14. Isaiah 65, 14. Turn over a few chapters. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart. Okay. Joy of heart. But ye shall cry for sorrows of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. Okay. People say, well, that's not quite there, but... Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart, the joy that's in the heart. Okay, and it talks about the spirit shall, shall howl for vexation of spirit. What's the opposite of joy? Vexation. Okay. You want to turn there, but Galatians 5, 2, 22, we read, But the fruit of the capital S spirit is love, joy. And you have peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. But joy... Is something that the capital S spirit brings in. Okay. Remember, 
Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, which included John the Baptist in the womb. Hmm. Where do you find true joy? In the Lord. Where does my true joy come from? The joy of thy salvation. God saved me and set me on the right path. The right path. I can go through all those verses again. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Therefore, thy word I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Sin doesn't please God. Why were we created? For thy pleasure they are and were created. I'm going to keep going. Okay? He put me on the right path and he saved me from hell. He's the joy. Remember, John in the womb leapt for joy in the presence of Mary, who was, or was, like I said, I believe, was, was caring, was with child at the time. But Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and John the Baptist was in the womb at the time. I believe the Holy Ghost was, was Mary the whole thing. Both of them. He leapt for joy. Colossians 2.5 you say, well, that still kind of doesn't say that the spirit can have joy. You know, the lowercase s spirit can have joy. Colossians 2.5. Our main joy as Christians come from the salvation of the Lord. The lost world will never understand what true joy is. All right? Colossians 2.5. There he is, 2 5. Colossians 2 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, this is Paul, though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in spirit, lowercase s, spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith, which is what? In Christ. His spirit is with him, joying, and where's that joy at? In Christ. But once again, we see that the spirit can joy, the soul can joy. If it's just a body, that it's not with child, it's just a body, then that just proves what we just read there. John the Baptist in the womb had joy in the presence of Mary and Jesus in the womb. Okay? Only a person, body, soul, and spirit, can have joy. It is a person in the, in the womb. Now I'll say this again, just want to reiterate, like I said, this could be a whole other study, Brother Sister Christ, and I suggest you do it on your own. Uh, and if God puts on my heart, I might do it. Uh, but what is Paul's spirit? It's joy in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Once again, where does our joy come from? Jesus Christ. And only a person, body, soul, and spirit, can have joy. A tree out there can't have joy. Animals can't have joy. Plants can't have joy. Inanimate objects, as they try to treat the child that's in the room, it's like it's an inanimate object, it's nothing. It can't have joy. Right. So why did we go this far? Because the question was, is what is God, how does God feel about abortion? I went this far, brother, says Christ, to prove the scriptures teach that it is a person the moment the child is conceived. You have a child, it is a person. And they don't like that. The lost world doesn't like that because that's convicting. You get an abortion, you are killing a person, a child. Is it murder? Well, what does the Bible say? Now we're going to start getting into what God thinks about abortion. Okay. Uh, in the Old Testament, where someone would, would cause a miscarriage accidentally or intentionally. Okay. Turn to Exodus 21, 22. What does God think? Exodus 22. This is a big, strong verse against abortion. Exodus 
Exodus 21. Sorry with this book. A lot of pages. Exodus 21, 22. And the reason I'm turning here, even though I'm reading here, because remember my notes, brothers and sisters, I have notes highlighting and underlying stuff that I want to, to really hit on. Um, I turn here so it gives you time to turn too, but you can also pause the video and turn. Make sure it's King James Bible, not any Bible perversion. Um, but Exodus 21, 22, it says, If men strive and hurt a woman with child. We went over this. What is with child? Body, soul, spirit. It's a person. Whether it's in the womb or out of the womb. It can feel, because that's one of the big things, they don't have feelings. They can, they can feel in the womb as well as out of the womb. Okay. And hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow. In other words, it's an accident. He shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. If, even if it's an accident, you still have to owe up to responsibilities to your actions. Though it be an accident. I, was, I didn't intentionally do it. I, I'm sorry. It was an accident. Sometimes you still have to pay for your mistakes. Okay. Verse 23. And if any mischief follow, it was intentional. If any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, Burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Let that sink in. There are, there are people professing to be Christians out there. Like the, remember we did the study about the term Christian, title Christian. What it is is the world likes to claim the title Christian for themselves when Christian is something you're called by the lost world. The lost world looks at you and go, oh, you follow Jesus Christ, you obey his word, you have a changed life, you're separate from the world. You must be one of those Christians. It's something you're called but the lost world likes to claim the title Christian. You have professing Christians out there that are okay with abortion. There, I know of uh, actual saved sinners that will say that abortion isn't murder. I think it was Peter Ruckman. They keep telling me, Peter, I haven't come across that video yet. Peter Ruckman taught that abortion was wrong. It was a sin. It's wickedness. You need, to, you need to not do it, and you need to stay away from it. But someone told me in one of his studies, he teaches that, but it's not murder. What does this say right here? Life for life. Right? The child is a person. And if you kill it intentionally, like today, abortion. So we're going to get over here and look at some stats. Abortion then it's life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. God, you know how God feels about abortion? It's wickedness and it's evil. You took a life and your life, and your life is now forfeit. You deserve to die. Now this is Old Testament, I understand. You say, well, New Testament, it changed. No, God's attitude towards this is still the same today. Okay. Now, okay. I'm going to try to link this in the bottom of the screen and see how it works out. But um, their thing is, is with abortion, they try to have all these excuses to try to justify it. What we just read there where it's unintentional and it's intentional. But the Bible uses the word uh, mischief. That's done out of mischief versus not done out of mischief. Okay. And that's a better word, mischief, because there's sometimes you do something, but you're, you're doing it, we're going to see here, okay, to when it has the wife, the mother, I'm sorry, the mother, and the child, and there's complications, and you have to choose to, to let the child die to save the mother, or you might end up losing both, okay? Yes, it's intentional to let the child die to save the mother, but it's not mischief. You didn't go into it saying, I want that child dead from... from if everything's perfectly fine with the mother, I want that child dead. That's what abortion is, predominantly. 
Okay. Now, they're giving you the big argument that you hear out there, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that they want to kill women because women can die when they're, when they're having children and they could kill the women and it, pregnancy endangers the life of the women and everything and that's why we needed abortion. That's why we need it. There's a lot of deception out there, brothers and Christ. Be very careful. Right? The Bible says life for life. Right? And when you get an abortion, and let's look at the stats real quick. 0.001%. These are the stats from the gut maker, G-U-T-T-M-A-C-H-E-R uh, Institute. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Guchamacher. And, uh, people who know that word probably laughing at me because I'm pronouncing it because I'm bad with words. Institute. They did a survey and they looked and counted the numbers. The, the amount of, of abortions is horrendous. Okay, it keeps changing all the time. Okay, so it's, all, it's, it's getting close to the, our max population every year, the abortions. 180, like over half our population in America. Okay. Abortions a year. Out of all those millions of, of abortions every year, let's look at their argument. Oh, we're doing this because it saves the lives of women. It's for the health of the women. 0.001%. The pregnancy results from an incestuous relationship. Okay, incestuous. I didn't know that word, so I had to look that word up. Sometimes it doesn't hurt to look things up, brothers and Christ. Don't just sit there and go, uh, he said some big words, so uh, I'm just going to pretend like I knew what, it, what he means. Take some time to look things up. I have to look up a lot of words, especially when it comes to the lost world. I have to look up a lot of words. And there's stuff in the Bible where I'm like, that's a new word? I've read it a million times, but God, for some reason, put on my heart, do you actually know what that word means? And I have to look up in the Webster's 1820 Dictionary, then I do a word study, which the whole point of doing a word study is to get the meaning of the word when you're comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. God will put it on your heart. You read that all the time, but you actually know what that means. Take time to study. Take time to look things up. So it says, insidious relationship. You look over here, it says, involving the crime of incest. In the Webster's 1820 Dictionary. You know, at one time it was a crime. And in the Bible, the Bible contends it for today. Okay, thou shalt not have, uh, you, you, you're not to uh, fornicate with your sister, cousin, brother, so on and so forth, immediate family to the so far back, okay, you're not to do that. And when you do that, today the body, our DNA, I, I believe our DNA is being deteriorating as we get closer and closer to the catch anyway, the body of Christ, whereas in the Old Testament you could kind of get away with it when their DNA and their body was better conditioned. I want to say more pure, but not, not as pure as Adam was before the fall. But it was more pure. They could get away with it. But God knew as time went on, with the wickedness of this world, that the body couldn't handle it. So he made a law, when it came to Moses, he made laws saying you can't do this. But anyway, when you do that, the child doesn't always form properly. It's hard on the birth. It endangers the life of the, of the mother. But that's less than 0.001% of all abortions is based off of that situation. The next one, 0.065%. Notice this isn't even 1%. 0.065% of all the, the abortions, the woman's life was endangered by the pregnancy. This is their big argument. This justifies it. This justifies it. 0.065%. All right. 0.085%, this is another big argument, I have to bear the child of, of, of when a woman is, is, and this is horrendous, when a woman is raped, okay, and they get pregnant, not, see, I said the wrong word, forgive me, Lord, when they are with child, I'm still, God's still working on me, when you're with child through rape, forced fornication, okay, it's 0.085%. It's still less than 1% of all abortions. And they'll use that as an argument to justify all these other abortions we're going to get to. Okay? But even then, I tell uh, sisters in Christ that who is it, once again, the Bible teaches, it's a whole, whole other study we did, 
Who is it that chooses whether someone gets is with child? That a woman gets a child and bears a child. Who is it that decides that? God does. God wanted you to have that child for a reason. There are men, and there are with brothers in Christ, there are sisters in Christ out there with testimonies that they are the victim of forced fornication. And they grew up, they got, they got saved and born again, and they're living for the Lord, and they have testimonies, and they are leading other people to Christ. Oh yeah. But let's just kill them, because it's forced fornication. Remember, God's the one who chooses whether someone is with child or not. God's the one that chooses. Once again, I still wouldn't just use that as justification at all. Go ahead. What happens? You have that child, you raise him in the admonition of the Lord. Okay. That's less than 1%. It's 0.085. It's not even 0.1% okay, of all the abortions. Now, 0.288%, the woman's physical health was threatened by the pregnancy. Some way, uh, I, you look into some of that stuff, the pregnancy, I know some women were told that they couldn't have kids because they suffered damage internally. Uh, I knew of a uh, woman that in the military suffered uh, damage from an IED, shrapnel. They, they fixed her up and she was good to live. Her health was good, but she was told that her health could not handle having a child. Okay, and some women still go and try to have a child anyway, and it might not work out. Okay. That's 0.288%. Okay. 0.294%, the woman's psychological health, <laughs> mental health, psychological health, was threatened by the pregnancy. Okay. I don't like that one. Okay, that's garbage. Right. Um, 0.6, but that's just the facts. That's the reason they did abortions, is because of that reason. So 0.294% of all abortions was based off that. 0.666%, there was a serious fetal abnormality. There was something that they looked at and said, okay, this is causing problems and it's going to kill the mother. Okay, it's going to cause so many problems. It's an abnormality. Okay, 0.666%. That one's at least close to 1% almost. Okay. Now, you add all those, even if you try to use all those as excuses, even the psychological part, you add that all together, that's less than 2% of all abortions here in America are based off of woman's physical health. And that's one of their big arguments today. They're fighting this because that's the reason a brother in Christ wanted me to do this because the Roe versus Wade got overturned. And the decision whether abortion is okay or not okay goes back to the states. That overturning Roe versus Wade did not make abortion illegal. It just returned it back to the states and each individual state gets to decide what to do with abortion. Is it legal? Is it illegal? Okay. It's up to them. And yes, some states have said abortion is illegal. Some states like California and uh, New York says no, abortion is legal and legal to the point that you can kill your child outside the womb within so many days that the, the child's born, we can still kill it and call it abortion. But let's look at the majority. They use this less than 2% to justify the other 98%. Let's look at the other 98%. 6.268%, the women aborted for social or economic reasons. What's the social reasons? Well, I don't know all the social reasons, but one of the biggest examples I can give and think of is that they got pregnant, there I said it again, forgive me Lord, they're with child, not pregnant, with child. Okay. See, it worked. you have to work hard to get things out of your vocabulary, and sometimes they still creep up. They are with child, outside of marriage, they fornicated, and now they're worried about what their parents are going to think, and how their parents are going to react. They're worried about friends, other family members. Um, they're worried about the group, uh, the, 
the, the city that they live in. Because in the old days, when fornication was shunned, okay, there was no abortion. Fornication was shunned. If you had sex outside of marriage, which is what fornication is, sex outside the boundaries of marriage, okay, and you were with child, you were shunned by the people around you. For a reason, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I, you know, you make mistakes. We're going to talk about that. This isn't going to be all negative, negative, but you make mistakes. You sin. We're all sinners. But the reason for that shunning was that what you did was wrong, and you need to know what you did was wrong. And now you have a responsibility. You have to raise, you are now with child, and you're going to have a child outside of marriage. So what they're saying is that 6.268% of women aborted for social reasons or economic reasons. And when you get to the economic side, we'll get into uh, to, um, uh, feminism. Okay, there's no way to get around it. I want my career. You get women that, that refuse to obey God's word when it says you're to be a keeper at home and you're to strive and study and practice to be a good keeper at home. You would be a good keeper at home for with your if your daughter with your mother and and your father. In the old days, the daughters lived with the fathers until they got married. Okay, there was no oh you got to act like a man and at eighteen you go out on your own and you get to go to college and you get to have your career and do your own thing. No, you lived with your family, your mother and dad, until you got married. And if you never got married, you stayed there and you helped your mom be a good with being a keeper at home. Okay. Um. But economic reasons, they have careers. I'm going to college. I fornicated. I had sex outside of marriage. And now here's the consequences. God has shown you the consequences. He made you with child. But you want, you're, going, you're still in the middle of college. Oh, I, want, I have a career. I'm in the middle of my career. And I want my career. And that's what they're saying. They're choosing worldliness in their career and themselves and using that as justification to murder children. Right? That's 6.2%. Now here's the other 92.330%. It's on there. It's 92.33%. This is like the majority of all abortions. No reason. It's just elective. Like an elective surgery. I don't like the way my, you know, my nose looks. So I can go and get elective surgery and have a nose job to get it to look the way I want it to look. Okay? It's elective. There's no reason. There's no justifiable re reason for them to be getting an abortion. Zero. It's just feelings and opinions. I know, I just, you know, I just don't want a child. I, I want the fun without the consequences. I want the fornication without the consequences. And that's what a majority of it is. So don't let them deceive you, brothers of Christ, and saying, oh, it's for the health of the children, the, the wives and everything and everything. No. What they're trying to do is they're taking the minority and trying to justify that 92.33% when it's all about the flesh. They want to be able to have sin for a season, as the Bible calls it, sin for a season, without the consequences. Without the consequences. Okay? And the two things that we see in there for the last two sets of percentages we see in there, it's promoting femi it's talking about feminism that I believe is in the world hardcore today, and fornication, sin for a season. Now feminism, the Bible describes feminism as women, I mean feminism is in the Bible, but women rebelling against God is. And that's what the world, the world tries to use their terms, they use the term feminism, but what it is is it's women rebelling against God. Imagine, I don't have a, a board or anything, I got a board in there, but imagine you draw a circle here, and you draw a circle here, and when you move these two circles together, there's a little piece where they overlap each other. Okay? You have woman, you have man. These are the boundaries that God set. And sometimes the boundaries overlap. Are we all supposed to be praying? Absolutely. Are we all supposed to be reading the Bible? Absolutely. Are okay, studying the Bible? Okay, there's some things that will overlap, but a majority of that circle is outside. It says, this is the boundaries God set for women. 
Okay, this is the boundary. This is the boundary God set for men. Men and women have different boundaries. And a little bit of it overlaps each other. What, we overla what we mean by overlap is there's some things that men and women both do. And God holds you uh, accountable to and responsible to do. Okay, there's some things. But there's a lot of things that don't overlap. And what it is, is women are rebelling against that boundary that God has set for them. They're rebelling against God, saying, No, I will not stay in the boundary you set for me. I'm going to break through those boundaries. And more than anything, it has to do with them wanting to come over to the men's side and be part of the men's boundaries. They're trying to do away with the boundaries, period. There is no boundaries. Women can do whatever they want. Okay? It's women rebelling against God. Okay? Women leaving the boundaries set by God to, to be like, to be like men, or to replace men. We see that a lot. To be their own head covering. Because the Bible teaches that when it comes to the head covering, it's not talking about this. I had, I had a woman professing to be saved claim that this is the head covering. And I'm like, no, it's not. The head covering is for a woman is a man in authority over her. And the head covering for a man is Jesus Christ in authority over that man. It works downhill. You know, it works, you know, in the military used to say it goes downhill. The higher the rank gets, if, if, if he gets mad, he'll chew the next person out, he'll chew the next person out. And the authority just slowly goes downhill until it finally hits us that when we were on the bottom. But you have Jesus Christ is the head covering of the man, the authority over the man, and the man is, has the authority over the, the, the wife. The husband has the authority over the wife. Okay? And it's, that's how God said it. And they try to take it away and say, no, it's this. No, it's that. And it likens the head coverings to hair. Because women have long hair. They're supposed to. It's a command of God. It's a blessing given to them. And men are to have short hair. Okay, because it is a shame if they have long hair. Okay, if they have long hair, it's likened to them having a woman in head, uh, as their head covering. The woman's in authority over them, not Jesus Christ. And the Bible warns about, uh, and I don't want to go too far off on this, but the Bible warns about how when you get married, you start worrying about pleasing your wife more than pleasing God. Your wife starts becoming your head covering and not Jesus Christ. I know brethren that have, have a problem with that, but... That's a whole other study, but the point is, is feminism is one of the big pushes. We saw that 6.268% was for them that wanted economic reasons and social reasons where they wanted to be like men. They want to have their own careers and their own jobs and everything. They don't want to be keepers at home. They don't want to get married. They don't want to be keepers at home. They don't want to have children and raise children in the admonition of the Lord. Okay. So 1 Samuel 15.23 reads, 1 Samuel 15.23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Even when men rebel against God, when they have their boundaries, you have men rebelling against God, and they want to be in the boundaries of the women. I don't know, just imagine the circles again. Okay, Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as, the iniquity, as, is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Talking to uh, Samuel's talking to Saul. You're rebelling against God. It says the sin of witchcraft. Feminism is women rebelling against God, and it says the sin of witchcraft. It's evil and it's wickedness in God's eyes. And feminism is pushing a lot of this abortion. Okay. The, other, the other big thing that's pushing all this abortion that we read here, 92, the 92.33% that says no reason, you know what pushes that? Fornication. They want to be able to sin and do things the world's way, indulging the flesh and live in sin, and have no consequences. Zero consequences. Okay. 1 Corinthians 5.1 1 Corinthians 5.1 
1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. In other words, the lost world. This, he's, trying to, he's talking to professing, saved people. Body of Christ. Brothers and sisters of Christ professing. Okay? And he's saying, you're worse than the wicked world is. There's lost people that would look at you and go, that's wrong. There's lost people that say, I'd never do that. That's moral, because the lost world likes to use the word morals, good morals. That's morally wrong. Not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Fornication is just out of control. And ye are puffed up. That's what we're seeing out there. With the world and what's going on. With this Roe versus Wade, you see all these women and men out there. I, I, I wouldn't call them ladies. I keep getting corrected. They're not ladies. <laughs> you have gentlemen and you have ladies and you have men and you have women. Okay, there's a lot of men and women out there that are going nuts and crazy. They're des they desperately need Jesus Christ, but with all their heart, they are rejecting him for this world. Okay? And what are they doing? They're puffed up. We see that a lot. They're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. We're going to get to this verse a little bit later, but remember the verse that talks about how they glory in their shame. Beware there's false converts that claim, they like to claim the title Christian, but they glory in their shame. That's not something a Christian does. The Bible, the Holy Spirit pricks your heart and says, this is wrong. Specifically what we're talking about. Abortion is wrong. It is murder. It is evil. It is wickedness. But you have some professing Christians that like to grab the title for themselves, you know, thinking they got a free pass to heaven so they can live in wicked sin all they want and be worldly all they want, and they got a free pass to heaven because they claim the title Christian. They never repented. Okay? They have head belief. The belief isn't down here. The Bible says in the heart, the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Not head knowledge, belief, the heart. Okay? But remember what it talks about, they glory in their shame. These false converts. They claim to be saved, but you look at them close enough and you say, wait a minute, why are they glorying in their shame? They should be ashamed of themselves. See, that ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that ye have done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present. In other words, I don't have to be there to see it. Some people say, well, you have to go through it to really understand. Or you have to see it to know. No, you don't. God's Word tells us what's right and wrong. And Paul's like, I don't even have to be there and see it to know that it's wrong. Okay? And to judge that it's wrong. Don't fall for that where you, if you haven't experienced it, you don't have a right to say anything. Uh, I have every right. The Holy Spirit and God's perfect written word. Uh, he's taught me what's right and what's wrong. Right? There's times where I have testimonies where I have made those mistakes. And I can give a testimony to warn the brethren not to make those same mistakes. But you don't have to go through something to truly understand it. Right? Paul's not there. And then he says... I, for I verily am absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when Paul later, earlier, we were just reading how Paul had joy. I'm with you in spirit, and I'm joying for you. Because why? Because you're in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. He called all things to become new. He's joining you when you're doing right according to God's word. You're taking God's word, hiding in your heart and living it. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. But here, they're going back to the old man. They're worse than the lost world. Is he joining in them? Is his spirit joining in them? No, his spirit's judging them. Okay? Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. He the spiritual judgeth all things. 
with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's how serious fornication is. It will destroy you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. God can forgive your sins and wash your sins away. But what people don't realize is the Bible also says, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. Well, yeah. there's still physical consequences. And fornication is one of those things that has a lot of physical consequences. Okay? But there's hope. The Bible says, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the capital S Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, putting down the flesh, ye shall live. Okay? Get fornication out of your life. Get feminism out of your life. Okay? It, it'll help you if you're truly saved. It'll help you with your walk with the Lord. Because right now I can't see how you have a strong walk with the Lord doing those two things for our subject that we're talking about, abortion. Okay? Turn to Mark 7.20. Mark 7.20. Mark 7.20. Mark 7.20. But if you through the capital S Spirit, those who are truly saved, to mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. God can clean up your life and, and prolong your life. Okay? But there's still consequences for living in sin when it comes to the flesh. The ultimate consequence of hell, when you truly get saved and born again, you are sealed into the day of redemption. You're going to heaven. Amen to all the brothers and sisters of Christ out there that chose to repent and believe and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Now that that's done, your sins will not send you to hell. That's where our liberty comes in. But there's still a consequence to sin. That's why Paul said, do not use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. There's still consequences to sin physically in this world. Mark 7.20 we read, And he said, That which cometh out, out of the man, that, defi that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries. I have that underlined. What is it, adultery? One of the two, are in, or both, are in the confines of their own marriage, but they're still having uh, sex outside their marriage. Okay, that's what fornication is, sex outside of marriage. The, uh, the word abor uh, adultery is when you are in the boundaries of a marriage, and you go outside that boundary to fornicate. Okay, they make it more specific. It's adultery. One or both are married already. Versus both being single. Okay, if both are single, it's fornication. But still sex outside of marriage. But evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. I underline murder, because what is adult? Uh, what is, um... Okay, ad abortion. It's murder. Okay, Thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. You are defiled when you give in to fornication. What is this 92% of all the abortions in America all about? Justifying fornication. Sin for a season. Right. We read in Psalms 97, 10, Yet ye that love the Lord hate evil. You know one of the things I always said about Jesus said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him, and make our abode with him. How you love the Lord is you keep his word. You take his word and you hide it in, his, in your heart. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. God teaches us what evil is in every form. Now we had the laws of God in our heart to teach us that we were evil, sinful, wicked people. But God fine-tunes it with the Bible, with His Word. Okay? And the laws of God are in the Word. Okay? So the laws of God are there. But it says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of His saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. 
Right? You that love the Lord hate evil. What's the Lord's attitude? What does the Lord think about abortion? It's evil. It's there to support wickedness and sin. And it's murder. It's there to support feminism. It's there to support uh, fornication. It's murder. Right? Brother says Christ, what if our attitude is supposed to be? You that love the Lord hate evil. He hates it. Do you hate it? You better. Proverbs 8.13, we read, The fear of the Lord is what? To hate evil. So if you fear the Lord, you're going to hate evil. If you love the Lord, you're going to hate evil. If you love the Lord, you're going to take God's word and hide it in your heart and live it. You're going to keep it. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way. What did we just read up there in Mark 7.20? It says, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. What was those evil things? Adultery, fornication, murder. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. What is evil? The evil way. And the froward mouth do I hate. God hates it. Do you hate it? Absolutely. I do. I pray that you do. But there are some professing people that profess to be brothers and sisters in Christ out there, part of the body of Christ, that they try to make excuses for, th for this evilness and this wickedness. They try to make excuses for it, to justify it. You're supposed to hate it. Okay. Why did the lost world that support abortion hate Jesus Christ of the King James Bible? Well, we just read there, it's evil. It's wickedness. What we're talking about here, abortion. It's wickedness. It supports feminism. It supports fornication. It supports murder. It's a child, but it's a person in your, in your womb. It's a child, a person that has a body, soul, and spirit. We prove this according to the scriptures. Okay? John 7, 7 reads, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Why do these fake Christians... Christians, that's why when I use that, it's when they misuse Christian, they take the title for themselves. Why do they really hate the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible? Why do they hate absolute truth? Why? Because that the works thereof, he testifies that the work thereof is evil. He shines a light on them and shows them for what they really are. Dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinners on their way to hell and they deserve to go to hell for the sins that they've committed against an almighty righteous God that's going to judge them someday and send them to hell and then to the lake of fire to burn, burn for all eternity. It's serious. I'm not saying that because I take pride in it. It's serious. That's the number one reason why they hate it. How do we know that? Turn to John 3.16. A lot of you brothers and Christ know this one. John 3.16 where they only read the first part and then they quit. They don't keep going. But you and I, brothers and sisters Christ, have been taught to keep going. Get the context of what's going on here. John 3, 16. Okay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, that's positive. That's why they like that. Verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Positive. And remember, they take repentance out. One of the big reasons why they take repentance out is they don't want people to get saved. God's will is that none should perish, but that all, all should come to repentance. It's the first step to finding God's grace. It's the first step to salvation. It's repentance. And it gets taken out. Because that's negative. We don't want negative. We only want positive. But we've been taught to keep reading. What happens when you keep reading? Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten, the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. 
What did we just read there in John 7, 7? The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. That light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. They love their deeds. They love their wickedness. They love their sin. They don't want that light shined on them. They don't want that light shined on them. That's a person in your stub, in, in your in the womb. You're with child. That child is a person. And when you go and have an elective surgery, abortion, you are murdering your own child. Your son, your daughter, you're murdering them. And for what? Feminism? For sin for a season? God's light, His Word shines a light on their sin. And they don't like it. Look how mad they get. How hateful they are towards this book. I've seen professing, remember they like to grab the title Christian for themselves, professing Christians that they go from being nice to just being just mad, angry, hateful, bitter. When you shine light on them, when the God's word shines its light on them. Why? Because their deeds were evil. And they were deceived into believing that they can have this world and, and just call themselves a Christian. Verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Remember what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. He's the way. He's the light. And then he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This book shines light on them. And they don't like it. Neither, okay? For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. We, brother and sister Christ, who truly get saved and born again, we come to the light and say, Lord, clean me up. Lord, fix me up. This new life that you gave me, tell me, tell me how I'm supposed to live. Tell me what's okay and what's not okay. Abortion's not okay. We come to the light and we say, Lord, shine the light on us. Anything dark that we have in us, get it out of our life, Lord. Help us to shine for you. Now that your light shined on us, let it read down from us to the world. We're supposed to be a light to the world. Jesus is supposed to shine through us. But if you keep holding on to sin and wickedness, especially this big sin and wickedness, you're going to look like the world and act like the world. Remember what Paul said about uh, the Corinthians, about fornication. Your, your guys are getting so bad with fornication, it's worse than the lost world. But that was back in his day. Today... Anything you can, anything the evil heart can think of is being done out there, out in the open today. No shame. They're glorying in their shame. No shame whatsoever. Okay. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's why they hate this book. They love their Bible perversions. They love their fake Jesus that's okay with sin, that has all this tolerance for sin and teaches them that they can sin all they want and just claim it under the blood. Just, oh, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. I can sin all I want. It's under the blood. And then when we read to them Paul, um, where it says, uh, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The light of God shining on us to get the sin out of our life. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Oh, no, no, no. It's, that's okay. It's okay. That's why they hate this book. That's why they hate the real Jesus Christ. That's why I got this on my car. I did that video I showed you, Brothers of Christ, where someone saw my uh, ma uh, magnets that are on my car, showing that the King James Bible is God's perfect written word, and that back to the Bible or back to the jungle, and if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? About salvation, my salvation magnets, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I'd rather go to hell than... Participate in your silly little book club. And he put a heart on it. I don't know if I mentioned that last time. But he put a little heart on it. He, he, he's, just, he's hardened his way to, to hell. He's hardened his way to hell. Because his deeds are evil. And he doesn't want light shined on his deeds. The world's way is always against God's way. 
It's always going to go against God's way. No matter, even if it, they put on this show that looks like it kind of lines up with this, when you actually look into it or you give it time, they're going to go hard. Once they grab people in and hook you and get you in, they're going to take a hard 180 and start going the opposite direction of the Bible like that. The world's way will always be contrary to God's way. What does God think of abortion? That it promotes evil. It's, it's promoting fornication. It's promoting feminism, the two biggest evils. And there's probably others. And that it's murder. And what we read, life for life. It's murder. There's no getting around it. And those that love God and those that fear God hates it as much as he does. Remember what we read. Hate evil. Those that love, truly love God hates evil. Those who truly fear God hates evil. Abortion is evil. They hate it. Okay? To professing Christians out there, okay, that we could wrap it up right there, but God put it on my heart. Okay? It's evil, it's wickedness. That's what the Bible says. Deal with it. And it's not me being prideful. I'm saying you either deal with the Bible or you go the way of the world. That's your two choices. Show that you're a false convert and you go the way of the world or you stick with the Bible and say, okay, that light was shining on a dark area where I, I, I knew it was bad and we shouldn't do it, but I didn't really want to believe it's mur it is murder. It's life for life. It is murder. You need to get with the Bible or you need to get with the world. There is no in-between. That's your choice to whoever's watching this. I pray, like I said, it's mainly for the brothers and sisters in Christ. So when someone comes to you and says, oh, it's not murder, you can show them where it's murder. You can show it's with child, where a child is a person. Okay? It's murder. It's wrong. It's evil. It's sin. Now, now God put it on my heart. We're going to shift this just a little bit. I know we've been here for a while. If you've kept up with me, brothers and Christ, praise the Lord. But God put it on my heart. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is directed at you. Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. Okay? Um, to brethren that have had abortions in the past before they've gotten saved, or you might have been newly saved, a babe in Christ, and you might have failed the Lord and done it. First okay. John one eight. Turn to First John one eight. I want you to know there is hope. God's not going to leave you hanging. There's hope. 1 John 1.8 1 If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. That is a sin. Abortion is a sin. If you participated in your lost life, or you participated as a babe in Christ, okay, you need to admit to God, confess to God, that it's a sin, and what you did was wrong, and it was murder. It was horrible. Fall on your knees before the Lord in prayer, in repentance, having sorrow for that sin. And guess what? God can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Okay. Today, there is no sin, period. There's no unpardonable sin today, period. You die in your sins, you will go to hell. We know this as brothers and sisters of Christ. But there, once we're saved, we're sealed into the day of redemption. There's no unpardonable sin today that you could commit that causes you to lose your salvation. It's not yours. That will cause God to take that salvation from you. True repentance leads to forsaking that sin. You need to start having a hate for that sin. Whether you were a father that was a part of it, or you're the mother that's a part of abortion. You need to have hate for that sin, and you need to start preaching against that sin. In your life, the life that you live, and anybody that comes across to you that tries to say abortion's okay, you're to preach against it. And you're to stand against it. You're to hate it. I didn't say hate the person. I say hate that sin. You're supposed to hate abortion. 
And if they won't listen to you, you let God deal with that person. But my encouragement to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that have had a part in this in your lost life, because sometimes it'll, your things that you made, the mistakes you made in your lost life like to creep up on you. Satan likes to use those things against you. Sometimes the mistakes you've made, I've made some really big mistakes as a saved sinner. I failed the Lord big time as a saved sinner, and Satan likes to grab those things and try to bring it back up to get me down, to hinder me from living for the Lord and doing the work of the Lord. Okay? Don't let it get in the way of your walk with the Lord. Get it confessed to the Lord, forsake it, and get back to your walk with the Lord. Okay? He is faithful to forgive us from all unrighteousness. Now to the professing Christians that support abortion or try to downplay it or make it like it's not that bad and it's okay, the Bible's got your number. Philippians 3.17. Turn to Philippians 3.17. We're almost done. Philippians 3.17. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk as so as you have us for an example. We're supposed to be a light to the world, and we're supposed to set the example. The elder men in the church, the elder women in the church, are to set the example for the younger men in the church and the younger women in the church. Okay? We're to set the example. Verse 18. Why is that important? Because for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whether they profess to reject Jesus Christ, or they're false converts. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, hell and then the lake of fire, to burn for all eternity, whose capital G God is their belly. It's all, they're, they're flesh driven. Romans chapter 8 separates cr true Bible believing, God fearing men and women from false converts in the world. You have people that are capital S, spiritually minded, and walking after the Spirit, Bible believing, God fearing men and women. And you have people that are carnally minded, walking after the flesh, whose God is their their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. This is the verse I was talking about. Whose glory is in their shame. They're glorifying it. They're, everything we see out there with the abortion and, and everything. I don't even watch anymore. The, the people that are picketing and the riots that are going on that they're not putting in the news media um, that are going on and everything for this. They're very vile, wicked, sinful people that desperately need Jesus Christ. But the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. And those people start acting in a way that's very evil, evil very vile. And they're glorying in that. They should be ashamed of themselves. But they're glorifying it. They're glorifying their flesh. They're glorifying sin. They're glorifying murdering children. So they can have their life the way they want it. They want to have fornication with no consequences, and they want that fornication, if they're, the, they also get into feminism, which most of them have, they want both those things without any consequences. Here he says, and who mind earthly things. Earthly things. It's all about the world and the world's way. They hate God's word. They don't want the light shining on them. For our conversation is in heaven. Okay, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Where's Jesus at? He's in heaven preparing a place for us. And then he turns around and says, uh, no, so Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And then it says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Our conversation comes from the word of God, and it's in heaven. Okay? From whence also we look, I had to underline that. That's present tense. Hold another argument. A brethren that turn their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ with the life that they live. Verbally, they say, I believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch me the body of Christ. But with their actions, they deny it. They've turned their back. They're no longer looking for Jesus Christ. They're no longer looking for that blessed hope. But anyway, it says here, whence also we look, present tense, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the workings whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. If you do not have such hate and disdain, hate for this evil, I just use the word hate, hate 
for this evil that's out there, the abortion, and the two things that's pushing the abortion, feminism and fornication. If you try to justify it in any way, or try to downplay it in any way, this is your number right here. God's got your number. 18, Philippians 3.18. Okay? You're gl helping glorify people's shame. You're trying to downplay something that they should be ashamed of themselves. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times should come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, and we're seeing it out there, with the sodomite agenda, with the uh, abortion agenda, the feminism agenda, the, the uh, fornication, the fleshly agenda, that just getting mankind just to be all fleshly. Lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, the sodomite agenda that's going on out there, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, people that despise me, those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, and here it is, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. If you profess to be a Christian, and you try to downplay this that's going on out there, or justify it in any way, shape, or form, I have to claim to say that you're lo lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. You claim to love God, but do your deeds prove that you love God? What do we just read? Loving God is to hate evil. Loving God is to take His Word, hide it in your heart, and live it. If a man love me, he will keep my words. They're lovers of pleasures. They're flesh-driven more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, you can try to pretend to be a Christian all you want, but denying the power thereof. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The power of the gospel is God gives you a new life and gives you power and authority to get that sin and wickedness out of your life. He cleans you up. But you deny the power of the true plan of salvation, which is why you reject it. What's the first step to, to salvation? Repentance. And they like to take it out. From such, turn away. Brothers of Christ, that's for you and me. From such, turn away. When you try to preach, and the reason I do this is because when you try to preach that abortion is sin to the lost, to people who profess to be saved, and they keep trying to justify it, what do you do? You treat them like they're lost. Preach the gospel to them and move on. The lost world, you show them that that's sin, you show them that's wickedness, that's murder, and you preach the gospel to them. That they're sinners, wicked, wicked sinners, and that they need Jesus Christ. They reject it, from such turn away. <coughs> you turn away from it. You, you planted your seed, someone else will come along and water, or you're watering a seed that someone else came and planted. And either down the road they'll get convicted and maybe truly uh, truly get saved and born again. Praise the Lord. Or they'll be standing before Jesus Christ at the great uh, great white throne and saying, look at all these times you got that you could have gotten saved. You could have repented. You could have repented. You could have repented. But you didn't. You chose the world. Depart from me, ye accursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. Right. And the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I never knew you. Bye-bye. Oh, Jesus is Lord. As you go down to the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Jesus is the Lord. Verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. I found this very interesting with this subject that we're talking about. Feminism and fornication and this whole movement out there that's being pushing abortion is being run predominantly by women. There are men behind the scene that love feminist women because they're easy to manipulate and use. And we know this, what we just read right here. For of this sort are they which creep into house and lead captive silly women laden with sins. God's got their number. Led away with diverse lusts. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is God, how does God feel about abortion? It's murder. 
and it promotes evil and wickedness, predominantly uh, fornication and feminism. Right? He hates it. And there's going to be fake professing Christians out there that try to downplay it or try to support it in some way or form or another. We're to have zero tolerance for adoption in our lives. We preach against it. And like I said, God put it on my heart to tell you, brothers and Christ, if you've ever done it, God will forgive you. You have to go to Him broken and having sorrow, true sorrow, for that sin that you did, that murder, killing a child, your child. And you come to Him broken and you ask Him to forgive you and He will forgive you. Okay? He's faithful to forgive. Right? And cleanses from all unrighteousness. So, that's the end of this study, brothers and sisters of Christ. Remember, we, our job is to preach the gospel. Our job is to be a light to the world by living the gospel to change life. I, told, I keep telling brothers and sisters of Christ, the big deception out there is we only have to be a verbal witness. Oh, I, just, I can just tell them the gospel and that's it. I can still live however I want. You're supposed to be a verbal witness and a living witness to the lost world. We're to be a light to the world. You preach the gospel... Uh, the gospel shines through you verbally when you preach the gospel and by how you live your life. You can lead people to Christ by just how you live your life. And they come to you and say, hey, I see something. I see something in you. You have something I want. Then the verbal comes in. It starts visual, then verbal. There's something different about you. Okay? You're to live the gospel, the power of the gospel as well as preach the gospel. We need to get out in there and we need to preach. We need to get that last soul saved. I mean, it's just crazy out there, Brother Christ. You look out there and you see what's going on, and I'm like, any day now, Lord, I'm ready. Any day now, can I come home? Can we come home? Is the time of Jacob's trouble about to start? Are we ready to come home, the body of Christ? To catch away the body of Christ, that blessed hope? Right? Stay in the Word of God and continue to live for the Lord. Don't get wrapped up in the world and what's going on in the world. We cannot change the world. It's going this direction because we're heading into the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's very close, I believe. And we're to live every day like it could happen today. Jesus could call us home today. Get back to your walk with the Lord. Get back to your walk with the Lord. Right? Uh, prayer, reading the Bible, sanctification, ministry of reconciliation. Preaching the gospel with the life that you live, as well as your words. Okay? Being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. That's what you need to be focused on. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next study.